Thank you, Dory. Thank you, praise team. In church, good morning. Good morning. I'm happy that you're here. I'm so glad that you braved the cold weather and that you made it. We had a, a guy in the early worship service that rode a van, one of our church vans this morning, and he said that he stood out in the cold for more than 25 minutes, waiting, waiting for the church van to come. And I was so thankful for him. Thank you for all of you who chose to be in the house of God today and to worship with one another. I hope that you're all doing well. I praise God today for a lot of things. I praise Him for central air and heat. Um, I praise Him for a vehicle with a heater. There was a time in my life when I didn't have either of those. I grew up in a house that didn't have any central air and heat, and on the mornings when we had to go to school, my mom would turn the oven on and open the door and tell us to come out, and we could put on our clothes next to the oven. That's how we would warm up, and we had to wrap up in blankets to get my dad's old Ford, three stick, three shift on the column, kind of an old pickup, and, and we would just wrap up in blankets. But no matter how cold we are, we had to go to school, man. We had a mission, and uh, we, we were going, and nothing could deter us. And this morning, I want to talk to you about the mission of our church, and nothing is going to deter us from this. The mission that God has called us to as a church, and we're putting other things aside and thinking about it today, and I want to show it to you. We have it on the screen. Look at this. Our church's mission is this, helping people find life in Jesus Christ by following him. Now, there are lots of passages of Scripture that speak to this, but, but we love that mission statement. It, it gives our church direction, and it gives us a kind of true north to, to pursue. And, and I want to show you a passage that speaks to it. Turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 10, verse 7. John chapter 10, verse 7. When you find it, you can stand up as we read it together. John 10, verse 7. All right. And y'all look great. Here we go. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. Do y'all see where I'm reading there? All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate, and whoever enters through me will be saved. Of all the things that, that, that claim that salvation could be found in them, Jesus is the gate. By him and him alone, we're able to find salvation. He is the one through which we can be saved. And it says, and he will come in and go out and find pasture. Through Jesus, we find rest, we find pasture. And then in verse 10, the thief, though, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. And we know that that's talking about Satan, the devil, and he wants to destroy your life. He wants to take you away from the gate, which is Jesus, and, and away from the shepherd, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that they may have life and have it to the fullest, or have life abundant and full. This passage is what we have written above our stage. I have come that you may have life abundant and full, John 10, 10. This passage means a lot to our church, and so I want you to really focus this morning. Whatever is going on in your life, set it aside, because God has a very important word for every one of you here. It is by no accident that, that God brought you here this morning. All the other things that you could be doing, the Lord wants you to be here, and he wants you to hear something from his word. And so let's pray over this together. Dear Heavenly Father, speak to us about how our church can help each other and others find life in Jesus, and how we ourselves can find life in Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for this mission. Um, I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to our heart. We showed up today needy, needing you on this Sabbath Sunday to put other things aside and to rest in you and to find you, God, and may we find you today. We seek you, and we're seeking you with our whole heart. 
Father, I know that, that everyone in here has brought all kinds of needs and anxieties into this place. Father, will you please minister to everybody in the unique way that they need you? I don't know what everyone needs, but you do, oh God. So please be with us, Lord, in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all can be seated. This is a great passage that talks about life. Our, our mission statement that says, helping people find life in Jesus Christ by following him comes from that verse, but we just as easily could have used the great John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but find everlasting what? Life, everlasting life. We, we could have used Colossians 3, 4 that says that Christ is life and that when he is revealed, all of us who have life in him, that we will be revealed as well. We just as easily could have used Matthew 19, where a rich young ruler or a rich young man uh, comes up to Jesus and we don't know what it is in his life that's beckoning him to do this, but he comes and he throws himself at the feet of the Savior and he says, what must I do, Lord, to inherit eternal life? There was something going on, something very, very personal. And, and he was rich and so we know that what was going on wasn't that he needed money. We know that he was a ruler, so what was going on was not that he didn't have power or influence or control. We, we, we knew that he was young, so we knew that what was bothering him had nothing to do with old age or aging or health issues. All of these things were going well for him, but there was still something that was greatly missing in his life. Perhaps he had poured into a ton of other things and found them empty, and he needed something more. He needed Jesus Christ. So he goes and he says, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's what he's looking for. In, in John 1, the way that the gospel of John even begins, it says that um, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's speaking of Jesus Christ. This is a great Trinitarian passage you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In the beginning um, was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God, and in Him was life, and that life is the light of man. And so, if people like in Matthew 19, people are like the rich young ruler thinking, there has to be something in this world that gives me life. What can do it? What can, if people are looking for life, and if John says that Jesus came into the world to give life, then it is so proper and right that the mission of First Baptist Marble Falls is helping people find life in Jesus Christ by following him. It's good. And so this is a wonderful mission statement that we have. It it fits our 135-year history. It fits what pastors before me have talked about, and it is exciting. The question, though, is, we have this great mission about what we're supposed to be about, but how do we do it? What is the journey? What are our, our, our stops along the way? What are the things that our church practices and does as a community of faith, as a family right here? What do we actually do that, that, that produces the life that helps one another follow Christ? Whether you're a brand new believer whether you're an old believer and you've known Jesus and you're still looking for life, whoever you are, what are the practices of our church that help us know how? How is the question that we're going to achieve this? And the how is very important. Five years ago, this next summer, my family and I walked across all of England during our sabbatical. We walked across, we hiked across Hadrian's Wall. It was about 95 miles. And, and, and my daughters complained for half of those steps. Not all of them, but, but maybe half. We, we, we marched about 95 miles and on, on Hadrian's Wall, Emperor Hadrian. It was built in AD 122 on the northern part of England. The wall was built to keep the Scots out of England, which is right. And uh, they had to do that. They built the wall and, and people now have been going over ever since and, and walking those old ruins and seeing all of it. And so we put our backpacks on and we started out and we walked all the way across. And, and when we were 
first beginning to plan it, what Megan and I knew is that we wanted to do it. And we knew the beginning and the end at the first. We knew we were gonna start out on the Atlantic Ocean in a town called Bonus on Solway. And we knew that we were gonna end up on the North Sea in a town called Newcastle. The mission was to walk it, but we didn't know how, not at the beginning. We didn't know the destinations along the way. We didn't know what detours we needed to take. We didn't know how, we just knew that we wanted to do it. We knew our mission, but we didn't know how, so we had to figure out the how. And, and in the end, as it turns out, the how was very important. The how is what meant more to us than, than actually doing it, because here's what happened along the way. Here, here is how we did the mission. Along the way, we wound up at this amazing place where William Wallace, the Scot, fought Edward the Longshanks that the movie Braveheart commemorates. We saw where all of that happened and, and, and where Longshanks ended up dying. It was, it was a, an amazing place. We, we, we saw a place called Vindolanda where, where there was a Roman fort outside and, and it, it was an amazing thing. And in that Roman fort, we were able to go in and see all of these artifacts that through the years have been found. And we even found some artifacts that were in, inscribed on various pieces of leather and stone and, and uh, things that were found that talked about Jesus Christ. So, so Christians from around the empire that were uh, uh, put in the Roman army and placed way out there on the far reaches of the Roman empire, that many of them were Christians and they found their, their writings all in the mud and all in the ground around this place. And this place, Vindolanda, has all of that. We, you, you go for a little further and there was a town called um, um, Gilead. And, and that is the place where, where my daughter Tess won a dart contest in an English pub with all of these men that were there, you know, and, and, and this old English tavern pub and we're all there and these men are playing darts and my, my tiny daughter walks up and finds herself in the middle of this dart game. And it got intense and intense and it came down to the very last throw and Megan is beside her and man, Tess throws a bullseye and the whole pub erupts. All of the Scots and all of these Brits and they're all just cheering and yelling after that. They, they, they called her in darts the Tessodactyl after that. We, we, we went to a place along the way. This is how, how we got to where we were going, a place we stayed at the Robin Hood Inn. And uh, it was beautiful in a place called Wall Houses. In the end, we achieved the mission. We did it. We, we walked it. But you know, the greatest part of it is not that we did it, but how we did it. It was all the things that I'm saying right now. It, it was the how that made the difference. And what I want to share with you is that our church has this mission to help people find life in Jesus Christ by following him. This is what we're working on. But how are we doing it? Because the how is really is what, what's going to make the biggest difference in your life. The how is where we get really practical. And, and, and the Bible talks to us about here's how we find life in Jesus, and it kind of brings it out. And over the years, our church has developed several ideas, kind of practices of our church that gives us the how that we achieve this. And I just want to, I want to let them rise to the surface for a moment so that you can see them. The how that we find life and show others life in Jesus. And here is the first one. Look at this. Uh, practice number one, or, or maybe destination number one on this journey of, of, uh, of our mission. Number one is learning truth. When Jesus was leaving our world in Matthew 28, he gives us the great commission and he says, go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them everything that I taught you. And so the apostles began, began teaching other people everything that Jesus had taught them. And y'all, when we carry on the teachings of the apostles, it is called the apostolic tradition. Everybody say apostolic tradition. Apostolic tradition. The apostolic tradition are all of the beliefs and truths and doctrines and theologies that Jesus' very apostles learned from Jesus, and he instructed them to start teaching it to everyone. And they did. 
Because at the very beginning of Acts, it says that the early church committed themselves to the apostles' teaching and that they met every single week and that they rehearsed these things. And so for all of us, if you're gonna know and find life in Christ, you have to know something about that Christ. Who is he? What does, he, what, what does it mean? There are a lot of people in this world that say the word Jesus Christ, but they get him wrong. They, 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 may have, they may know something a little bit about Jesus, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus. There are a lot of things that, that you can kind of miss Jesus. And so we have to learn the truth of what it means to have a correct idea about Jesus. And on top of that, to have an intimate and a real relationship with him that makes a difference in your life and how you behave and what you think, how you, how you envision other people and issues in our world. All of this is learning the truth about Jesus. And, and you never get to a point where you have learned with an ED on the end, learned all of everything you need to know. The great thing about the Lord is, is you get to keep studying and new treasures come up all the time as we learn about him. Uh, in our church, the way that we try to help encourage people to learn truth is through what we call follow discipleship. Follow discipleship. Lane kind of runs all of this for, for our church and, and the youth ministry and children's ministry and legacy ministries. They, they flow out of follow discipleship and follow discipleship creates all of the spaces and the places and the ways that, that our church can engage the word of God and do it in community with each other so that you're learning the truth with somebody and you can talk to them about it. And, 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 and as iron sharpens iron, two people can grow and get better. This is highly important. You learn truth with other people. So in follow discipleship, you can learn truth in, in our follow classes, and those are on Sunday morning. You can do it in our follow groups, which happen all throughout the week. And if you're not involved in a follow group, or follow class, you need to be involved in these things. You, you can do it by being involved in our women's uh, studies. Uh, women, our women have Bible studies throughout the week, and we are just beginning. Men, get ready. We're going to do more and more in our men's ministry this upcoming year as well, and those will come under the follow discipleship idea. Um, we have a great Wednesday night prayer and Bible study led by a man named Ralph Hathaway. And on Sunday nights, we have an expository Bible study that just takes the um, books of the Bible and passages of the Bible, and it just teaches them and it goes through them verse by verse. If you like an expository Bible study, Sunday night is where you wanna come to learn the word of God. We also have ways of giving you devotionals as an individual and devotionals for your family and devotionals for you as a couple. Whatever you need, anything that deals with learning and, and growing in the truth of God, we have these things. And I, and I just wanna remind you that if you call yourself a member of our church, we expect you and you expect each other to be involved in learning the truth of the Lord because we, we, we can't help people find life in Jesus Christ if we don't know who Jesus Christ is, amen? If we don't, if we're not thoroughly invested in who Jesus is, we cannot help people find life in him. And if we can't define what that life is and what that life is not, then all of it will be for nothing. We have to know something about the life and about Jesus and, and that is learning truth and, and it's great. We're doing it right now. Right now we're involved in learning something about the truth of Jesus Christ. But that's not all. We, they, there are other destinations and other kind of practices uh, of the how we achieve our mission. And here's the next one. This next one is wonderful. Uh, practice two is worshiping God, not just learning truth, but, but we worship. And y'all, when you worship, it is not just in here together. I, I wanna take you to a different place of worship and that is just you tomorrow. When you go to work tomorrow, if, if the roads are open and if you go uh, or, or go to school or whatever you do, your lifestyle is that of worship. Worship is not just what we do in here, right? Worship is what you do 
with your actions and with your mind and with your body. And in Romans chapter 12, it says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You worship all day, y'all, all day. It's when you, it's the idea that you feel like doing something and you know that it is not pleasing to God, but your body craves it. Your body wants to do it. Your mind wants to go there, but you say, I can't. I can't go there and do all that because God wants me to do this. When you choose the way of God versus the way that you feel like you wanna go, then you're worshiping God. Uh, that when it talks about offering your body as a sacrifice, it, it, it's the image of the Old Testament where they would bring a goat or a cow or something and they would offer that sacrifice on the altar. In the same way, you worship your God when you feel like you're, you're, you're tempted, your body wants to do one thing and you say, no, I can't. I can't, that, that's not gonna help me. It's going to lead to destruction. It's gonna lead to bad habits. It's not right. God wants me to live differently. And when you do that and you say, God, I want you to be glorified in my sacrifice. I'm not gonna do that. And it can even be found in the little things, y'all. Worship is even, even here. When you think, I wanna eat the whole pie. I wanna eat all of that, it's delicious, my body craves it, that's what I want. It, it can even be worship when you say, no, I'm gonna have just a little sliver. I'm not going to overeat. I'm not gonna overindulge. Um, that's worship when you say, God, I'm offering you my, my body, even in little things. Worship happens when, when you feel like sleeping too much. And you say, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I, I'm going to get up. I'm going to be active. Worship happens when you do something and all of your flesh desires to, to engage it and make you feel good. And you say, no, I'm going to do something that, that, that God wants. Worship is when you, your body wants to lust. It wants to lust, but you don't let it. And you say, no, I'm gonna resist all that. And, and Lord, will you please be glorified in my worship right now? It's offering the Lord our mind and saying, God, I, I wanna think things that please you. When you do all of that tomorrow, I want you to think I'm worshiping my God. And Lord, be glorified and be praised in the same way that, that you do when we're all in here together. This is my spiritual act of worship. And picture this, if all of us do that throughout the week, we're all striving to worship God in our daily lifestyles of what we think and what we do. And then on the wonderful Sunday mornings, we bring all of our worship in here together and we worship as a community of faith, as a family of faith. And then it becomes very, very special, something that is almost intangible, that, that it's hard to describe. The best poets in the world couldn't quite describe it, to have people who care about each other and they love each other, and they have already been worshiping in their lifestyle to the best of their ability through the week, and they bring all of that in. And then in, in, in the unison of their voices, in the belief of their heart, they join together in agreement about the songs that they're singing and about the things that they're hearing and the passages of scripture that they're hearing. And there is a connection and a bonding that happens with everybody. And, and, and at those moments, that's when Jesus says, if two or more are gathered together in my name, I'm gonna be there. And have you not experienced the presence and the, the, the joy of Jesus Christ in here in worship at some point in the past? Have you not? Yes. Have you not experienced moments of glorious rapture inside of your heart when a song has begun to be sung, perhaps, and it is exactly the song that you were hoping maybe that morning, or a passage of scripture being read and the Holy Spirit ministers to you and gives you something good, and you think, yes, worship, 
happened to me today, God, and it happened with my friends in this place. Hasn't worship happened when, when you're coming into this place and you share something significant that's on your heart with a friend that's here? Maybe a, a moment when you're leaving and you share a burden that you have with somebody and the family of faith carries your burden on their shoulders. It's worshiping as a community. And this, this is the, the thing that in Hebrews, it says, do not forsake the local assembly. Don't forsake it, meaning in your life this year, don't get into a habit where we're missing, missing, missing. Coming together and experiencing worshiping in community is forgotten and, and neglected and kind of brushed off as, as a sideshow in the Christian life. It's not a sideshow. It is a primary thing. We cannot help each other find life in Jesus Christ, nor can we help anybody else find life in Jesus Christ if we are not worshiping the Lord together. Worshiping the Lord is, is exciting. And you, it, it is here but not only here, it's everywhere you are. Uh, Jesus told the woman at the well in John 4, they were argue, she, she was trying to argue with Jesus about where you worship. And she said, you Jews say that it's important for us to worship in Jerusalem, but we Samaritans believe it's important to worship here. And Jesus says, woman, I tell you the truth, there's gonna come a time when you neither worship here or in Jerusalem, but you're gonna worship me in spirit and in truth. And y'all, what spirit and truth means is that, it, that, that you're worshiping God out of the truthfulness, the authentic genuineness of who you are. And you're laying yourself very transparent before the Lord. And you're saying, God, I want you to be glorified, even though I'm a fallen, messed up person. And I haven't done right in anything, but, but, but Lord, I love you. And I want you to be glorified. And I worship you in this moment. That's truth. And, and, and your whole spirit is crying out with it. You can do that anywhere you are. If y'all will all agree to worship God tomorrow, would y'all say amen? Amen. Let's worship him tomorrow. And then next week, we'll come back and experience all of us, one, uh, all of us here together again. But here is the next one. We're, we're almost through with this. Becoming holy helping people find life in Jesus Christ by following him. Part of the how is that we are becoming holy. We sang a song a moment ago that, that God is holy, holy, holy. And the word holy means he is different. He's different than other people's version of God. He's different than, than, than anything uh, in our world. He is set apart from it and he calls us once we have given our lives to him to start looking different from our world as well. And, and I know that this seems kind of odd, but the Bible is very full of this. It is prevalent throughout scripture. And in Colossians 3, 5, it says, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. So none of you were born a Christian. And when you were born, you were born into a sinful nature. And that sinful nature is all over our world. It permeates our world. It's systemic in our world. And you're a part of all of that. But when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came into your life. And from then you begin to be transformed and to look different from the way that you were. We grow, we change. We are not like Popeye who said, I am what I am, and that's all that I am. We am what we am, that's true. But we are not all that. In Popeye's idea, well, there's nothing that was ever going to be transformed, nothing that was ever going to get better, nothing that could really grow and, and become something uh, that, that understands more, that's transformed. That, that's not the Christian version of the life that, that God gives to us. And for us, we get to grow. Isn't it exciting that you can be a better version of yourself? That the old ideas that, that, that caused you uh, to, to, to miss God or that plagued you, the old ways you used to argue with people that was selfish, isn't it exciting that you can set some of that over time behind you? You can get better. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we can become like Jesus Christ. And, and, and the membership of our church is absolutely committed to this. Now, our membership is not perfect. All of you are, and, and me, man, we're, we're far from perfect. 
We know that we've sinned. We know that we uh, are not our, our, our sinners. But, but what we believe is, is that we're going to try not to sin and we're going to try to be holy. Y'all, our membership expects you. If you are a member of this church, the rest of the members expect you to, at the bare minimum, try not to sin. Try to follow the Lord. Do your best to follow the Lord. Because what is the only other alternative? If anybody said, oh, that's too great, that's too much. Can you imagine the alternative? There's only one alternative to trying not to sin. And that is being totally okay with it. Uh, the... And it doesn't matter what the sin is. You, you have to say, okay, I recognize that this is wrong and I'm going to try not to do it. If somebody comes to join our church, and it may be something that they think is the littlest thing. They said, you know what? I want to be a member here, but I want you to know that I'm a gossip. I say really bad things about people, but thank you for accepting me like I am. And thank you for just being okay that I'm a gossip. And I said, well, are you going to try not to gossip? And they said, no, we just want you to accept me like I am. I said, well, you can't be a member here. And they, said, and they say, well, well, why? And I said, well, because you're not even trying. You have to say gossip is wrong, and I'm going to really try not, not to do that. Because y'all, when the Bible says if you want to know the will of God in your life, you have to strive to be like him. You have to strive to try to uh, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind and to not be like the rest of the world. And then you'll be able to know and approve what God's will is. But you cannot know God's will if we just think, oh, I'm just going to do whatever, whatever I want. I'm not even going to try. And, and, and we can't. Our church and even you in your personal life, you will never know God's will for your life and God's vision for your life if you're wallowing and wallowing in sin. We're not like pigs. We fall down sometimes. We get dirty, but we get up and we say, please forgive us, God. We dust ourselves off, but we don't stay down in the muck and in the mire and wallow in it. We say, Lord, help me to do better and to move on. We try not to sin. All of this is about becoming holy. We aren't holy, and, but we are becoming, becoming, pushing into it. And so here is what one of our, uh, uh, if you take Connect 101, here is what it says, that First Baptist Church of Marble Falls believes that Christianity should be transformational. We should grow. And this means that each member is publicly committed to being transformed into Christ-likeness as a disciple of Christ. A member's entire life is voluntarily subjected to biblical ethics and morality within the community of faith as we all grow together. Y'all say amen to that. Isn't that great stuff? Man, these are the people that I want in my life that, 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 that join me in this kind of thing and they, 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 they help me. They know that I'm not perfect. They meet me in that place. They, 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 they don't judge me in it, but there is this beauty of, of, man, together we can do something better. Let's put those old ways behind us. Becoming holy is a part of helping people find life in Jesus Christ because how do you help people find life in Jesus Christ? Or how do you find it yourself if you are simply continuing all of the sin that this world says is okay? If sin takes away life and hurts life, and in Jesus there is life, that means we have to put away sin and grow in Jesus. It's the only way. And, and when I think about what our world is dealing with today, all of the depression, all of the nihilism and the hopelessness and giving up and all of the affairs and all of the lustfulness and all of the issues and the selfishness and the racism and the sexism and all of it, you put it all together and the idolatries and all of it, aren't you glad that you're not like the rest of the world? Aren't you glad that there is a different way, a more beautiful way that God gives to us and here it is. You can become holy and find life in Jesus. And here is the very last one. We are also showing the gospel, showing the gospel to others because this thing that is helping us find life 
learning the truth, worshiping in community together, becoming holy. Those three things are exciting. They're giving us life, but why would we ever keep it to ourselves? If, if it is that life-giving, if through Jesus, the gospel is that life-giving, why wouldn't we offer it to everybody in the world? and want them to be able to come in and experience it as as well. We don't manipulate anybody. We don't coerce anybody. We simply say, here is our story of how we have found life in Jesus Christ, and it's for everybody. Would you like to experience it too? Showing gospel is is our phrase for evangelism or missions or outreach or loving care for other people. When we show the gospel to somebody, we are doing it two ways, through... Um, good news words, good news words. That is when you speak of Jesus Christ, when you speak of the testimony that you have, good news words, but it is also good news actions. Actions. Throughout decades and decades, Christians have often struggled in evangelism. What is more important? Is it telling somebody the gospel of Jesus or just showing them the love of Jesus? The answer, of course, is yes. It's both. It's both. Don't don't ever, 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 ever get caught up in that stupid argument. If, If all we had was words, but we don't have any action to show people the love of the Lord, then our words set us up for hypocrisy, even more hypocrisy than we already have. It sets us up for um, giving them a message that's kind of irrelevant or a message that that, that, um, is ambiguous. But, But when we say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and they say, well, what does that mean to me? And, and, and then we show them the love of God and we say, here's what God is for you. Then our actions end up validating the words justifying the words, defining the words. Words have to have actions. They have to have them. They're vitally important in evangelism. And so when we show people the gospel, it's good news words and good news actions at the same time. And I think that over all of my years here, our church gets pretty jazzed up about this stuff. We love it. If there was a a vision, a missional vision, y'all really rally behind these things. This is kind of who who we are. Y'all pulled together, and and just in a couple of weeks, we're going to be finished with our entire mission center on Avenue R. It's almost finished. And then we're going to put our counseling center in there and our our, uh, uh, food pantry in there and our creative hearts quilting and sewing ministry and, and, and all kinds of other ministries are going to go in there. It's going to be great. Y'all built that and you did it. And why? Because there is something of showing the gospel that matters here in this house. When, when members of our church said, hey, we believe that we're called to go to a foreign nation, y'all pulled together and we figured out how. The, I, I've noticed this about all of you that if we were able to say right there is brokenness and need and ugliness, and I think that Jesus can fix it like this. My history with all of you tells me that y'all want to do something about that and that you will pull together and that you will rally behind each other to make something like that happen. Showing the gospel. Uh, I, I, I'll finish with this idea, y'all. The hows, um, learning truth and worshiping together and, and becoming holy and then being evangelistic, but, you know, bringing the gospel to others. This is the hows by which we experience the mission of our church and the mission is accomplished. But without these, the mission is simply words. Our, our mission is it's exciting, helping people find life in Jesus Christ by loving him, by, by following him is good, but it's just a statement if we don't have all of the hows with it. Um, and it help, they help us stick to it. A lot of people have a good mission statement. A lot of businesses have a good mission statement, but that means nothing, nothing. Enron had a good mission statement. 
Oh, they had a darn good one. Enron, that company that in 2001 went bankrupt and they were charged with corruption and they hurt thousands and millions of people by their, by, by all of their corruption. That company had a fantastic mission statement. I'll read it to you. I looked it up. It says this. This is, this is Enron's mission statement. As a partner in the communities in which we operate, Enron believes it has a responsibility to conduct itself according to certain basic principles that transcend industries, cultures, economies, and local, regional, and national boundaries. And we do this with our values. Value number one is respect. Value number two is integrity. Value number three is communication, and number four is excellence. And here is how they define respect. Respect, we treat others as we would like to be treated ourselves. That comes from Jesus, man. They got that from from the Sermon on the Mount. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Enron is quoting Jesus in their mission statement. That is awesome. I want to be a part of a company like that. I'll join that. Um, I want to do that to a company that says things like that. But in the end, we know the real story. They, They didn't give a rip about that mission statement. They had another one, another mission statement that was kind of an, an unstated but understood mission statement that Enron exists to do anything that we possibly can do to make money. Understated, but understood. It doesn't matter then. It doesn't matter what a mission statement is. What matters is you have that, but it is the journey. It's how we get there. And, and to practice learning truth and worshiping together and becoming holy and showing the gospel, what you're going to notice is that on this journey, y'all, that, that we're involved in, if y'all will do these things all the time, all the time, the cumulative effect of all of it is going to be radically transformative to your life. You're going this year, you're going to grow. You're going to know the Lord. He's going to set you free from certain things. And you are going to walk with Jesus more intimately than you ever have to commit to this journey and stopping at these destinations. And I hope that you will do that together so that as a church, we can fulfill the mission that God has given to us. Would you bow your heads with me?